All right. Um, so just to, just to make sure I'm, I'm in sync, um, who was here at the talk yesterday, uh, my talk yesterday? A good chunk? Okay. So I'll expand, uh, I'll expand the, uh, some of the basics as fast as possible. All right. So uh, in case uh, you don't remember this from yesterday, <laughs> Um, I wrote <laughs> O'Reilly's books on embedded Linux and embedded Android, and the purpose of the slide is to say that I don't know everything, and in, otherwise, in other words, it's an invitation for you guys to please jump in and actually add stuff um, as uh, I'm moving if you have something to say. Um, <laughs> somebody came up to me after my talk yesterday and said, you lied. I said, why is that? Well, he said, you said you're going to slow down after a bit, and you didn't slow down, so... <laughs> I will try doing this. Uh, sorry, no funnies today, okay? Uh, <laughs> I don't have any uh, funny things in my slides. But what I'll try to do here um, in the next hour or so, um, since I'll, it's actually after lunch, right? So ho hopefully you've got a good dose of intravenous caffeine somewhere. Uh, I'm going to try to walk you through the different ways in which you can run code in the Android stack. And it's a pretty big stack, so there's a lot of things that you can do. I am sure some of you uh, will be familiar with some of the stuff. Um, and I'm hoping that on average, by the end of the session, there is a lot of stuff that you will not have known about that I'll at least introduce you to, OK? Um, I'm very easygoing about these things. So if you have any questions and you want to interrupt or whatever, please feel free to do so. We'll pick it up from, from there and, and move from that. OK. So the basics, I showed this yesterday. I don't want to spend too much time on it. There's some specific kind of hardware for which Android is designed, uh, the whole system, the G, what's in the SOC, and that's the stack that you've got. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one today uh, because I think it's, it's important because that's the whole point of my conversation is where can you run code in this thing, all right? And you can literally co run code almost anywhere here, okay? The question, of, uh, the question then becomes, uh, what's, what are the hooks? What can I do uh, with you know, my code if I run it as a native daemon, as a system service? What are the benefits and trade-offs of every one of those layers? Um, you know, uh, and, and, and how does it connect to the next layer up or underneath it? OK? Um, yes, is that a question? No? OK, I'm sorry. Hal, so on. OK. What can you program in an Android? Well, if you've got control over the platform, you can use anything that you can dream of. All right. Basically, the out of the box, the stack will allow you to run Java and C. All right. Both at the app level and at the platform level. So if I go back to my architecture diagram from two slides over, um, both in the orangish, yellowish, and uh, obviously not the grayish stuff for C uh, for uh, Java, but you know uh, both in the uh, app layer and in the system services, you can have either Java or C. Um, that's not a problem. Some people want to try to write their applications as uh, AJAX or you know JavaScript, CSS, and stuff like that. And there are frameworks that actually facilitate this. Okay, so you can create an app that has a uh, WebKit object, and then you can put everything in there if you wanted to. All right? There are uh, frameworks such as the Titanium App Accelerator. There's PhoneGap. There's probably a couple of other ones out there. And what they kind of promise you is that if you write your application in that framework, it will work regardless of um, you know, the device that you're running it on. Okay? So for example, Titanium App Accelerator, uh, allows you to write your, uh, your app in uh, Ajax, and then it will compile native applications for iPhone and Android. So if you're, in the if you're looking at it from an application perspective, that could be something that's interesting to you. What I've heard is feedback from, uh, or at least even if you kind of Google around, you'll find that is people will tell you that the feel, the look and feel of the application that's generated is not quite the same thing as if you really write it into the uh, the native uh, kind of language that the system has. All right. Um, if you want to use C Sharp, all right, um, our friends over at uh, Mono, who uh, actually now have a company called uh, Zimian, um, they actually, um, no, actually not. 
He's looking at me weird. Zamarin. <laughs> Zimian was the old thing that got bought no mail. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> that's like that's with the looks, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I've been around too long. Um, so <laughs> Zamarin is the name of the company today. They have a framework for actually running C sharp code both on iPhone and Android, okay? Um, so if that's your thing, then go ahead and do that. Um, obviously, the fact that you have control over the framework means that you can compile whatever you want. It could be Perl, Python, anything that you have, and you can run that in the stack, okay? Um, you can just shove it in there as a, even a statically linked binary and have the interpreter run from there, okay? Standard application mechanisms, okay? So that's essentially you're at the top of the stack, completely over the API uh, that's provided to app developers. What can and can you not do, okay? So the basic components, um, activities, um, content providers, services, and so on, that's standard stuff. I'm not gonna waste too much of your time on this because some of this is gonna be basic uh, for some of you guys. Uh, and uh, if nothing else, there's a lot of documentation on it. But just kind of give you a very rapid rundown of the mechanisms you have um, uh, that are available to app developers. So uh, apps are made of components. There isn't a single entry point. There are several components inside an application. Each one of them can be activated independently of one another. So app developer have to you know, create their things with that in mind. There are four types of components. Um, one is a uh, visual, which is activity. Services are kind of like background things. Content providers are databases, and broadcast receivers are kind of like very high-level interrupt handlers, like you know, batteries low, USBs been plugged in, that kind of stuff. Okay, so you deal with those things. You create an app like that, and the components will get activated based on rules, which are uh, spelled out in what's called a manifest file. I'll get to that in a second. The way those components activate each other is with a mechanism called an intent. Intents are actually passive objects. It's what you do with that object that will activate a component. The intents will get resolved by some of the system services, namely the activity manager or the package manager. I am talking fast because that part's supposed to be basic. Um, the components can be stopped and restarted. The whole framework is made so that applications can get uh, essentially um, stop on their tracks and then restart later. The whole goal is what is that the user can start as many apps as he wants and if he gets bored, he can continue doing that without having to go back and manually shut them off. They will die off naturally if they're not being used for a long time. This is the life cycle of what's called an activity. So uh, it starts off on this blue, the blue thing up there um, and then it gets an on create and if you Google around for um, app examples, you'll see a lot of those on create and eventually it's running and then if it's no longer in the foreground, it gets a pop or whatever, there's gonna be a um, on pause and um, you know, it goes from there. You specify an application using what's called a manifest file, which is an XML file, which, uh, where you have to spell out all of the components that you have statically. There's only the broadcast receiver that you can actually create at uh, runtime. Everything runs in a single Linux process, single threaded, unless you do something special. And by way of special, I mean um, something like uh, using Java threads or creating a service that provides a remote interface or have a content provider that is callable remotely. In those two cases, the callees side runs on a thread pool. So there's no need for you to start threads, but there are threads gonna be involved in the running of that, okay? All remote procedure calls are done through Binder, which is the core mecha communication mechanism that you have in uh, Android. It's used between system services and between applications and system services, okay? So, what are the constraints that come with the fact that you have this kind of environment? First of all, there's this component lifecycle, which makes it so that when you run an application, your application could randomly be shut down because the system's uh, predicate is low memory um, and therefore if the, there's too, many, too much stuff running at some point it will go around and say well that's not been used for a long time let's just shut this down all right and if you have some critical piece of code that you want to have all the time that's a problem okay um, the other inherent thing with um, this is that uh, and I don't have a slide for this on uh, right here, but it, you're straight jacketed into the security model that Android has, which means that your application cannot access dev foobar, okay? Uh, your application can only do RPC through binder and get access to whatever is on the other side. That doesn't mean that you can't tweak the permissions or grant your application specific permissions to access a certain devi device entry in slash dev, but that's not what happens by default, 
Okay. The other thing, um, so one of the tricks that, um, yeah, so the, one of the tricks that's pulled off with regards to um, applications that are stopped and restarted um, is uh, in the framework, there's at least two applications that kind of circumvent that mechanism of life cycle. And the way they do that um, is they create what's called a persistent application, all right? Um, the very good example, a very good example of that is the phone application. Okay, the phone application houses the phone system service. Uh, and if you're familiar a little bit with the framework, you know that typically system services are not part of apps, okay? Simply because they can get stopped and restarted. So you don't have a control of that. So what they do is they actually use um, the application component. And let me actually show you that. So um, let me go here. Nope. Apologies or not to those of you who use VI. <laughs> so if I go to packages, apps, um, phone, this is the um, manifest file for the phone application, all right? And uh, one of the key things this has is this Android persistent equals true. What does that mean? Well, let me actually show you. So, um, Lunch. Let's get this guy running. By the way, I'm not very good on time here, but when's the next presentation starting? No, no, the next presentation. Not the previous presentation. Well, this guy's starting up. Three o'clock. Okay, cool. All righty. So this guy's starting up, and let me actually turn that into a different schema. ADB shell. Come on, you can do better than that. PS. All right, starting up. Don't crash. <laughs> All right, okay. Here we go. So PS, uh, you can see here there's an application called com Android phone somewhere up here. Yes. Uh, PID number 394, is that right? 394, all right. So uh, let me show you one thing. So there is, say for example, the calendar. Calendar is 642. If I do six kill 642, 642 is gone, all right, and um, there's no calendar anymore. So far so good. Take the phone guy and kill the phone guy off, 394. P.S. The phone back, phone guy is back, all right, and he's going to keep coming back uh, forever and ever and ever. Uh, no, actually, that would be nice to do something like that. And here it is. Okay, that's the f that's that's the fact that the application is persistent. Now, the obvious thing um, for those of you who are <clears throat> familiar with the um, app development API, uh, the obvious question is, okay, well. What actually is getting started? You know, because the, the application is getting back up, but usually what happens is for an application to start, you have to send an intent and it starts an activity, it starts a content provider, it starts a service. What exactly is running, right, when it's resurrected? Well, that's the application component that you see here, okay? There's an application component that usually app developers won't use. Uh, but these key applications do use them, and that application com uh, component gets kicked off uh, or started, uh, kicked off or started whenever uh, it, the thing is resurrected. And in the case of the phone application, this application thing is used to actually register system service. Okay, so this is one way of actually housing system services. So if you want to <laughs> extend the framework and add your system services, I'll show you later. Uh, one way to do it is encompass it inside an application and have it marked as persistent and use this application thing. Yes, sir. Awesome question. So can I actually publish a application on the App Store that uses persistent equals true? And the answer is no, you can't. <laughs> um, you can only use this if you are actually part of the AOSP, building as part of the AOSP. Do All right. Sorry, go ahead. A, a, a specific user? Do they have to have an, a specific user? No, they don't. 
But usually, in the case of at least the, the phone application, it does. So in the case of the phone application, if you go for the manifest file, yeah. you go to the top, it has uh, something like uh, shared user is phone, so on. And the re only reason this one has this is because there's an entry in slash dev that it needs to access. Uh, and, and that is, is uh, I think it's radio. Uh, 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 this ID is the radio user. And so the phone application runs as radio. And then there's an entry, entries in slash dev which belong to radio. Yeah, but so the, the, the persistent property is not really with the user uh, mm. selected by the application. In as far as I understand it, the persistency of the application is not tied to the user. Yeah. It is tied to the actual uh, built as part of the EOSP and starting as part of the system applications. <clears throat> All right, widgets. Um, the clock that you see, and there's plenty of the widgets, you can have those. They're actually started after the launcher starts. So there's plenty of documentation for that online. So if you need to write a widget, this uh, have a look at the documentation that's up there. There are some special mechanisms that you can use that aren't, you know, um, commonly used all the time, but there are, they are interesting still. So, for example, if you want to write a standard application for a phone that is persistent, right, the only way to do that is to use what's called foreground uh, notifications, uh, foreground services. So the way you do that is you have to post an icon on the status bar that says that your app is running, okay? So for example, here I have a Vast, uh, which is the uh, antivirus thing, and it shows up as an icon on the right hand, uh, top left hand side, okay? Uh, if you've got Skype running, it will also show up in, as an icon there. And the only way these apps can do that, I'm sorry, the only way these apps can run in the background is by posting that icon. If that icon's gone, the thing's shut down, okay? So that's one way to do it. Um, the persistent thing I kind of showed you. Um, there's something called sync adapters. So if you have a, um, if you've ever installed like a Twitter application or something, or, or, or G+, all right, that kind of connects to a backend uh, to sync events. This is what the mechanism that's being used. Uh, essentially, register a sync adapter, and every so often that sync adapter is kind of launched by the system, and it connects over to some backend and checks if there's new data, and then puts that in a database, and it gets updated in the, um, in the UI. Uh, backup agents. Um, so there's, uh, you can actually have um, your app back its data up uh, into Google's cloud. <laughs> Um, it is safe and secure up there, so. Uh, <laughs> um, it's being outsourced to some third party. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, that's a mechanism that's available to app developers. Uh, input methods, if you want to create your own virtual uh, uh, keyboard, there's documentation on how to do that. Um, so sometimes it's just a foreign language, but sometimes you actually want to have controls which are specific to whatever device you're creating, right? Um, so you can have input methods, and there are examples of that out there. Uh, alarm services, um, if you will get one, uh, want to get woken up after a certain amount of time or a specific time and date, uh, you can use that. As you can see, I'm kind of like pointing you URLs here because a lot of the stuff is already out there. So I'm, you know, I'm going to stick to the things which aren't too uh, documented in terms of of uh, the slides. If you want to have a live wallpaper, uh, that too is documented out there. Um, account managers, so uh, whenever you go into settings and you go add account, and then there's like, oh, uh, well you've got this application installed and you can add account for it, there's a mechanism that ties those two things together. And there's sample code out there on the developer website on how to actually uh, do that. Uh, device administration, so if you want to, um, you know, when you uh, the bring uh, your own device kind of thing, right? Uh, some enterprises want to control the strength of your password or the number of times uh, if you're it wrong, wipes the, de the device away and that kind of stuff. So there's an API for that. There's a flag called core app that you will find in some uh, applications and some manifest files in the AOSP. Uh, to be quite frank with you, um, I'm not sure exactly what this does, but uh, you've got an only core flag in systemserver.java that is de by default set to, uh, um, uh, 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 to, uh, to false. So therefore, um, you know, they don't just run the core applications, but the core applications will be something like, uh, as it says here, you know, status bar settings and you know, some packages, but you know, um, most of them aren't marked as, as core application. Um, if you need to start applications, 
How do you do that? You usually use intents, and uh, if you need to communicate with a specific content resolver, you use a, a content provider, you use a content resolver. That will automatically start applications uh, remotely. Okay. Let's say you want to start, you want to create your own native utilities and daemons. So this starts to get more interesting. Um, essentially, uh, if you're not too familiar with the build system, uh, what's important is what kind of build targets are you uh, going to generate. So in this case, if you, use, if you generate something that uh, it uses build executable, then it will actually generate a command line uh, utility. So if I go, for example, to um, the sources here, and let me go for, say, <coughs> frameworks, native commands, service. So service is the uh, command I was using yesterday to show you the list of services. So let me actually kind of do a refresh here. If I do service list, it lists all the system services. This is a native binary. And if you look at the uh, Android MK here, essentially it ends up with this uh, build executable, which means just build a binary, okay? Um, and I'm giving it the sources and so on and so forth. And if you look at the sources of this, so the sources of a native binary such as this one, uh, they're you know, almost typically the same thing as a you know, standard Unix uh, application, right? Main, and then you do from main whatever it is that you're expecting to, do, to have this thing do. Right, nothing really special about this. Okay, um, obviously the question is where can I start this from? When I have a native application like that, uh, you can use the shell. Uh, you can have it in a in an RC file. So, for example, let me show you uh, the service manager. Remember, um, if you go back in my diagrams, I said that for a system service to be recognized as a system service, it has to be um, seen or registered with the service manager. The service manager here is actually a command line utility. So if I go back to the same location I was, underneath service, there's service manager. Uh, and if I open the service manager up, it's got a main entry point somewhere in here. Okay. Um, and it goes from there. All right. Uh, but you don't actually start this one off the command line yourself. Instead, what you do is um, if I go into system core <coughs> uh, root here and this is what I want, the initRC file. So the initRC file is the file that is parsed by the uh, init process. And I'll come back to this uh, in more detail a little bit later. I will find the service manager here. Okay, So that's being started at startup automatically. Right? So if you have a native tool that you need to run, you can just go ahead um, and have it also run by the initRC file. Going back to my other slide here. Okay. Um, you can also have shell scripts, and I'll show you a slide about that. And you can also have, uh, and it's, it's kind of a little bit weird, but you can do that. You can have an application start a command line utility. And I'll show you a snippet of code that actually does that. Um, so you can, get, you can actually write an application that you can put on the market that does logcat. So you just put it on the market, and, and it issues logcat on the command line, and retrieves it off the device. Okay, so those, the, uh, I showed you two examples. I showed you an example where it's a command line utility. I tap the command, it does the result. And I showed you the other one, which is actually daemon, okay, running in the background, doing stuff. Both of them are possible as native executables. Uh, to start from an Android app, um, here's actually the, the slide. So essentially, uh, this is just standard Java. This is not actually specific to Android. You talk to what's called the runtime, and you tell the runtime, here's something you want to run off the shell. Uh, the important thing is that this is actually, uh, if it is something that's running in the background, it might actually continue running even after the application is dead uh, because it's, it's, just, uh, it's just there uh, running in the background. Okay, Java utilities. So uh, most of us, at least um, that have played around with the uh, Android a little bit, know that if I go back to here, all of the stuff running up here is typically in Java. Right, the applications are written in Java. Okay. Now remember uh, yesterday. Where was I? So I went on the command line here, and I did something like uh, I used AM, okay, to actually start an application on the uh, on the system. Remember that? Okay. Um, so well. How does AM actually work? 
right? Where is that? And what does it do? Right, because I used it to start an app off the command line, okay? So let's go see this. Um, if I, uh, AM is actually in system uh, bin, AM, here's AM. Wow, lo and behold, it's actually shell script, okay? Uh, and what does that shell script do? Anybody know what this is? It's, it's starting a class, right? That's in a jar file, okay? And how does it do that? It uses this thing called app process, right? App process is actually, it's actually a command in and of itself. App process here. Um, this is a command line utility, and if you go in the sources, uh, let me actually close a few windows here. Get back to this guy. If I go to frameworks, <clears throat> native commands, I have, oh, actually they put it, oh, they, they, they've been moving stuff around and I'm not, there we go, app process, it's a C file, okay? Uh, and um, this is how, how the zygote, if you're not uh, familiar with it, actually gets started with this app process thing. So it starts a Dalvik virtual machine and tells the Dalvik virtual machine, run this Java class. Okay, so in other words, <clears throat> I should be able to find AM around here, and if I go here, there's AM. Remember that shell script I showed you earlier? It's right over here, okay? And if I look in here, I have an Android MK that at the end is gonna generate a Java library, okay? And if I actually go in SRC com Android commands, AM, AM.java, I actually have here standard Android classes being imported, and lo and behold, what I've got underneath here is a Java-based command line utility, right? This is really cool, uh, because it means that I can write a command line utility that talks straight to the framework. Now, that doesn't mean that I can create activities and that kind of stuff, but it does mean that I can use the classes that applications, at least some of the classes, or most of the classes that an application would have access to uh, as, a, as, a, as part of the regular API. Okay, that's, that's really powerful. So in this case, they use it to actually talk to the activity manager directly, right, and, and invoke it directly. And in fact, uh, one of, um, I, I was giving a class at some point and somebody said, wait a second, AM can do things I can't do in an application. And the reason it can do that is because it's being built part of the AOSP. And if you've ever done such work, you know that when you're building as part of the AOSP, you have access to APIs which are not available to app developers, okay? Uh, if you look around the API, so for example, let me, go, let me give you a good example here. If I go to frameworks base core Java Android, say OS, and I look for <clears throat> power manager, okay, ipowermanager.aidl, that's the interface definition for the power manager system service. It's marked with at hide, okay, which means that this is not going to show up in the SDK. You can have something else showing up in an SDK that kind of gives you the, almost the same thing, but it's, this is not it. Anything that's marked with add hide in the sources will not be available to you as part of the SDK, but will be available to you if you're building as part of the AOSP. So therefore, um, that command line tool can do things that a standard application can't do because it has access to all those hidden APIs. Um, and the same thing goes actually for a couple of those things. So I showed you AM. But um, say for uh, PM, I'm sorry, PM is the same thing. You have a PM script and then uh, sources of the Java thing. SVC is the same thing. WM is the same thing and so on. So whenever you need to talk to the framework, um, this is a nice trick to know about. All right, system services. So this really is, um, you know, as, uh, uh, how can I say this? Um, of the many things that you may want to add in the framework, this is probably the one that's most interesting, okay? Um, if I go back here to my architecture diagram, remember I said those, um, the applications here can get stopped and uh, restarted at whim. Um, well, the system services, on the other hand, are there from boot to reboot. And essentially what happens is that the system services act as a gateway for accessing the hardware. So that means permission checking. Uh, it means sharing the same hardware piece amongst many um, 
uh, colors, which can be different applications. It also means enabling the, the hardware functionality for other system services. Okay? Um, so being a system service is something that is very useful. So let me actually show you this. You have system services which are, um, where am I? Okay, you've got um, system services which are part of the bulk of the system services which are written in Java. You've got at least one which is part of an application. That's the phone, app, phone system service. Um, and you've got a couple which are completely written in C. Okay. Um, anybody have an idea where some of them are written in C and others are written in Java? So my best guess is um, it's a time critical thing. Anything that seems to be time critical seems to be written in C. So the media uh, uh, system service is written in C. The surface flinger is written in C. Uh, the sensor service is written in C. All, right? All of these things have to do with human interaction. And the, you know, the assumption is that it has to be snappy. Okay? Um, whereas uh, a lot of the other stuff, like the activity manager, window manager, uh, battery, uh, and, and so on, they're, they're all in Java. Okay. Um, the construct of how that works is um, somewhat complicated. So let me kind of walk you through this. Uh, <clears throat> you have an application, all right, that's trying to talk to a system service. All right. It's actually not talking to the system service directly through Binder. Uh, it'll start, start off by doing a get system service, which will give it an object. Okay. That's this part here. Get system service gives it an object. And um, actually, those, um, those files, Java files and C files, they're actually, um, you, you can look on the web. I have a whole um, thing on, on GitHub, which is uh, the, all those files are up there. So if you want to play around with this, it's an example that's out there. So um, you grab uh, the application, gets an object, which is called an Operasys Manager. And this manager is just a gateway, OK? It's a dumb object that doesn't really do much. But that object turns around and actually talks to a remote API through uh, a binder, which is implemented in this uh, interface here. Uh, in this case, I call it iOperasys service. And that thing is the gateway for the actual system service, which is written in Java, which is part of the other system services. And then that system service turns around and talks to an actual JNI counterside, which talks, which goes on through the HAL, grabs a SO file, which actually has the HAL module that talks to the hardware. Why are we doing it this way? Because essentially, this application can't talk to the driver at the kernel level. The applications don't have access to the slash dev entries, right? They have to remotely ask something to do that on their behalf. And that's the job of the system service. Now, why is the system service so complicated? Well, because it goes through a HAL layer. And the HAL layer's purpose is to allow manufacturers to keep things in, in, uh, in the user land, which uh, can be proprietary and therefore not put in the driver that's underneath. OK? So if you want to run a system service, uh, you have to play around with these, with these pieces. All right? So here's uh, the example code, actually. Um, so I have here a operative service which extends iOperasys service stub. That's defined in this AIDL file. Okay? Uh, don't mind too much what the actual system service does, but the AIDL file specifies the public API that this system service has. And it is marked as at hide, which means that an application won't be able to see this in the SDK. But something building in the AOSP can call upon this. All right? <clears throat> um, I have to manually add the AIDL file as part of the files that have to be built in the framework. Um, I also have to add the system service here as part of the system services that get started in system server dot, um, Java. And from that point on, that system service can be called from within the AOSP. If I want to make that available outside the AOSP, I then have to go inside um, the actual framework and then uh, make my system service available through get system service, which is the public interface. Um, and there's a few things that have to do to actually make that happen. And then you eventually have to have this operas manager, which going back again to my earlier diagram is just a shrink wrap object, which acts as a gateway for calling the remote thing. Okay. Questions so far? 
No? OK. OK, you can write shell scripts, right? Um, it used to be that the shell script they had, the uh, shell they had in Android sucked royally. It was a NetBSD based one. Uh, recently, they added a, um, the MirBSD corn shell, uh, which is a lot more powerful, a lot more interesting. And essentially, you can um, uh, add stuff in the initRC file that will get started as a shell script. And um, the emulator actually does that. Which gets me to the initRC file. So let me go grab the initRC file and kind of show you around uh, a very, very quick tour here of what's in that thing. So if I go to system core root dear init.rc. So that's the configuration file for the init process. There are two types of entries in the initRC file. There are actions and there are service declarations. The actions start with the on keyword. You can already see, uh, you should see one up there. Um, and the services start with the service keyword. The services in the init RC files have nothing to do with system services or the service components as part of applications. A init service is a init service and nothing else. Okay? So these are the two types of declarations that you have in those files. Each one has different semantics. An action which starts with the on keyword has a list of commands that it runs. So on early init, you can run this stuff. On init, you do all of this stuff and so on and so forth. Services on the other hand, okay, have properties for whatever is getting started. So service, service manager starts what's on the other side here. This is the binary and this is the parameters that tell init how to actually start this service. Services have all have to be all have to be part of a class. This is why you have this class core and uh, there's a class main underneath here. And as part of one of the actions, so um, in the on boot, the last thing this on thing does is class start core and class start main. So those instructions are actually starting all the init services that follow underneath. Okay. So what you want to do is if you want to add something to you want to have add something to the startup. You can uh, add a service declaration and make sure it's part of core or main, and then it will start as the system starts up. Um, there's a main init RC file that is for all AOSP builds of a given version. So if you get 4.3, there's an init RC file for all 4.3 init RC, uh, uh, for uh, 4.3 based devices, and then you can have a per product init RC file that has that specific devices in its stuff uh, inside of it. Okay, you want to write a C library? Just make sure your code builds with build shared library and it will just generate essentially um, a dot so file. Okay, there's nothing really magical about that. There's plenty of examples of libraries inside the AOSP. The, if you want to look for examples, in fact, if you go to system core, there's a whole lot of those lib foo bars over here. Okay, you grab, say, for example, libcutils. Here's an Android MK, and it will tell you how it builds that. You can have fun look at this. Um, right, and obviously you can load C libraries from Java code explicitly, like this system load library, which here will load the uh, lib hello jni.so file, um, or in some cases. Um, the, the SOs will be loaded automatically elsewhere. You can generate Java libraries with build Java library. Remember those AM, PM, uh, and WM commands I was showing you earlier as command line tools written in Java? The jars are actually generated with this, um, build Java library. Okay, um, and if you don't want to generate your own SDK, you can generate what's called SDK add-ons. So uh, that allows you to extend the API an app developer has access to uh, without generating your own SDK for, uh, for your developers. Uh, that's really interesting for a lot of people who are doing a better work because it allows uh, you to actually tell the, dev the, the, the developers who are writing for your platform, well, go grab the SDK from Google, okay? And here's an add-on that I'm giving you that it gives you access to this other API that, that you don't get, okay? And that additional API could be talking to system service you have running on the device that's really special to your thing that's not accessible through the regular APIs and then you know it's accessible by, ha by way of having that uh, uh, SDK add-on available. Okay, and I'm going to end with this part. Well, as we were saying this morning, <laughs> 
Android's really interesting, but sometimes I actually want more than whatever Google's giving me. Okay, how do I do this? Okay, um, obviously the whys and what ifs are, are here if you want to care to read my slide. But essentially, you know, for whatever reason that you want to get a legacy Linux system, such as say something that's generated by Buildroot uh, or that's uh, generated by Yocto, and you want to get this this in Android, um, you know, there's you know, the question becomes, so how do I do this? How do I mix those things? Because, I mean, if you look at what they're doing, so let me actually show you an example of what they're doing, and it'll kind of give you an idea of how complicated things can become. So if we go to external, let me go grab something that comes straight from Linux. Um, so let's go for, hey, S-Trace. Sure you guys should know about this. So um, how is S-Trace typically built? Well, um, we should have some kind of make file in here. I'm not seeing it, or I'm blind. No, that's not the one I want to show you. So forget about S-Trace. <laughs> Let me show you something. <laughs> Zlib. Uh, no, not Zlib. Oh, come on. Libjpg. Libjpg. Is that there? Lib. All right. This is not going to be by consensus. <laughs> um, there, I, this is one is good. This is a good one. Okay, so um, bzip2, all right, bzip2. If you look in the sources, it has a makefile, right? Classic capital M makefile. However, they're not using this. They have a Android MK, and you can actually browse through those sources, and there are, are other multiple examples of this where essentially they're generating an MK for any given thing they're importing from the outside world. That's interesting for them. But for you, that can be just overkill, all right? So there is a good reason for being able to stick around with the common stuff. So let's try to get something like this. Having essentially uh, my stack, which is based on glibc, talking to something remotely on Android. And this is fairly trivial. I have a whole bunch of customers doing this. Essentially, use sockets or whatever other mechanism that's built inside the kernel. Um, you're running on the same kernel, so it really doesn't matter, OK? Um, and then you just use that to talk, or you could, if I'm, some people have said, well, why, why don't you use binder? Well, it's just a delib binder is not built against glibc, but you can probably get that to build with glibc or whatever. Um, and, you know, whatever it is, whatever mechanism you use, you can have those two stacks talk to each other. Okay, it's pretty trivial. But what you want to do is actually um, have some way of having the build system lump those two things together to the, out, the resulting images that it generates. Okay, and that's really the trick here. Is how, how do you do that? How do you make, and how do you make it work? Okay? Um, so the first thing that's really important to remember, and it was actually mentioned in the talk earlier this morning um, uh, with the uh, non-mobile uh, you know, uh, uh, non uh, Android uh, stuff, um, is essentially Android doesn't use the same file system hierarchy as a typical Linux system or even an embedded Linux system. And most importantly, Android puts its libraries and uh, its binaries in slash system lib and slash system bin. Okay? So it doesn't use slash lib and slash bin. Those are free for us to use. So what we do is we actually populate those okay, with whatever we generate with the other tool. Okay? So let me actually show you an example of what I did with the, uh, I sat down with uh, Thomas and Maxime from Free Electrons earlier at the uh, ABS uh, this year. And we just, you know, just as I was mentioning earlier uh, uh, at the keynote this morning, it took us about like 10 minutes to get this to work. So uh, I'm going to go here in 237glibc1. So you can see I have a build root directory. Okay. Um, I went in here. Sorry. So this is just a standard build root. I didn't really change anything in here. Um, Four minutes. Thank you, sir. So um, I extracted build root, and what I've got is a custom Android MK that actually just says, uh, by the way, um, why don't you add um, build root FS to uh, all pre-built? And then in here, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to extract the tarball that got generated by build root into the resulting output uh, directories, and you know that's it. So once you build build root, you go back to the top of the AOSP, you build, and voila, your final root file system has got build root stuff inside of it. Okay? There is 
a few, uh, um, few things you have to uh, keep in mind. All pre-built doesn't exist in 4.x. Uh, you have to change one of the main MKs to actually add this as a target. That really isn't too much of a problem. The kicker, however, is the following thing. Um, if you go into system core, and this one took me kind of some time to discover here. There's um, uh, system core include private Android file system config.h. So <clears throat> here's the thing. Um, the users and their rights are defined statically in this file. You don't have an Etsy password. All right. And the other thing, um, so here's the users. Um, and the other thing is that the rights for every file in the file system are laid out in this in in structures which are here. And so you've got um, essentially um, system bin which is executable. Uh, you have bin which is executable, but you don't have slash lib star executable. And if you forget to add slash lib star as executable in here, when the system runs, it will tell you that it can't run the binaries. Okay, permission denied. So you have to add this in here. So in fact, all the kind of steps here, and then you can change essentially init RC to start. Sorry. Sure, you're right. I mean, it's just whatever. Uh, it's just if you want, the thing is, if you just make the linker executable uh, on the file system on the host, and you don't put lib star, what will happen is when it generates the final file system, the linker won't be executable. So this is why you have to add lib star, or you could do lib slash the linker name, but I just don't bother. I put link. I, I just put lib star. <laughs> um, so. Um, you can change also the startup so that it starts BusyBox as the console instead of Toolbox. Um, and you can you know, change ADB so when you do an ADB shell, you get a BusyBox shell and all that kind of stuff. But once you have this, you can go in the initRC file and have essentially the Android initRC start anything you have in this other stack. That's not a problem. Okay? Uh, the only penalty you're paying by having this, this kind of dual-headed environment um, is that you have uh, more storage being taken by whatever you added, and at runtime you have an additional C library in your RAM in addition to Bionic. But that's it. In terms of performance, whatever, I mean, the load of whatever you're adding on the other side is, what you, uh, is, is the other penalty you're going to pay. <coughs> Questions? <laughs> uh, from your uh, exposition, it's not clear why it works this. What? I'm sorry? It's not clear why it works. It's not clear why this works? Why it working? it's working. Because uh, if you, why uh, an application which has been built in the Android, uh, built executable, uh, will link Bionic and, and the application which is built in Beardroot will, be, will link. Oh, okay. So why is the application um, linked against Bionic uh, uh, essentially not Kind of. Why is there no conflict so by having to? Well, the, well, these, uh, services, sure. These okay. So the the easy answer to that is is found by running um, 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 what's it called? Um, where where is my read elf? All right. I'm in the wrong directory. USB four three pristine. So if you do read elf. On out target product generic system. No, it's not magic. It's it's. I mean, it's just the the linkers are different. So if I go to service, uh, yeah, hyphen a less. Okay, um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Before they kick me out. There we go. Okay, requesting program interpreter system bin linker. Okay, yeah. um, so it, this is using. Um, yeah, I will stop in a second. <laughs> uh, this is um, this is the linker it's looking for. If you actually look at a glibc linked one, it will look for lib ld uh, uh, whatever or you know so on. Yeah, the answer is the tool change. The, the, the tool change the difference. Yeah. All right. One? Yeah, go ahead. One Quick. Uh, the, the ruler has stopped talking. Yeah. Did any Android source code go into that? Did anything? Clean it's a clean build. If you uh, is there any Android stuff in the root FS star that was generated by build root? None whatsoever. Build root was built. I mean, I could have built build root outside, and still copied it. It it doesn't make a difference. All right. Thank you, folks. <laughs>